Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 211 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sabalski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Interest in the way pre-Christian societies interacted with the natural environment is, well, evergreen. We know that trees were a fundamental part of early medieval society, technology, and culture. But how did pagan communities preserve and adapt their thinking about trees in the face of increasing missionary activity? This week, I spoke with Dr. Michael D.J. Bintley about the evolving role of trees in early medieval England. Michael is an associate professor of medieval English literature at the University of Southampton and the author of many articles on early English culture, environment, and literature. He's the co-editor of Trees and Timber in the Anglo-Saxon World and Representing Beasts in Early Medieval England and Scandinavia. He's also the author of Trees in the Religions of Early Medieval England and Settlements and Strongholds in Early Medieval England, Texts, Landscapes, and Material Culture. Our conversation on the use of trees in medieval England, how missionaries approached pagan practices, and how old beliefs were recycled and reshaped is coming up right after this. Well, thank you, Michael, for joining me to talk about trees today. I'm really excited about this because it is a topic that I think has a lot of interest across the world. So thank you so much for coming on to talk about trees. Thank you. It's really lovely to be here. So your work is on early English religion and trees in particular. When we're talking about early English, what time are we talking about? The period that I'm talking about and that I cover is broadly from 400 to 1100, really. And because so much of this engages with environmental contexts rather than necessarily political contexts or named deities, those edges are a bit more messy and frayed, perhaps, than they might be in other areas. Okay, so what does it look like at this time in England? Is everybody the same? Are they all doing the same things? What does it look like sort of in terms of politics and religion? How do you summarize 700 years uh, so quickly? (laughs) That's our job here, right? (laughs) (laughs) I think one one of the reasons why I was particularly interested in thinking about trees and environmental context from the get go is Because we have that period, that space at the beginning of the period, the 400s, the 500s, really going on into the 7th century, where so much is in flux and so much is uncertain. And we have such a dearth of surviving written sources for the 5th centuries and 6th centuries that we don't know a great deal in many parts of what's now England about what's going on and whose affiliations are what and what languages people are speaking, what gods they're worshipping, and particularly the kind of role that environmental features like trees and forests and stones and springs, what role they have in people's systems of belief. So the more you think about it and the more you look into it, the messier and the more complex these things get. Archaeology is the window into that period, really. We have some surviving written sources, but they post-date that period, like Gildas' work on the ruin of Britain, which is partially a religious polemic as much as anything. So you need a fistful of salt to to read and and read anything into what Gildas has to tell you about exactly what people were doing. So approaching the period from the beginning, the idea of of a, a homogenous group of people, I mean, just isn't there at all. What does this world look like after the end or transformation of Roman power? To what extent are people thinking about themselves and continuing to present as Romans or Romano-British? And then what kind of role do other new communities or expanded communities, settlers from the continent or from Ireland, what part do they have to play in local and regional politics England today, like Britain and so many other places, is made up of often fiercely regional identities. Accents get stronger towards the edge of borders and county boundaries. And you can, those those older stories about being able to tell which part of a road someone was from, let alone (laughs) that they were from a different county. So to what extent is that a feature of the cultures of belief at that time is something to think about. A period I'm especially interested in because it's where texts begin to get involved 
well, texts are more heavily involved and textual sources are more heavily involved in interpreting that history is really the end of the 6th and the 7th century. And that's the period of conversion and missionary activity. It's often forgotten in these grand narratives about the so-called invasions of Angles, Saxons and Jutes that there are, of course, plenty of Christians in Britain, and there have been for a long time already. And work by scholars like Tom Pickles, for example, has pointed out that British Christianity, insular, existing British Christianity, primes the pump for those resurgent missionary conversion efforts that are spearheaded, according to Bede, by Augustine, later Augustine of of Canterbury, who's coming from Italy, sent by Pope Gregory the Great, uh, and the work of Irish missionaries as well. Sorry, please do jump in. (laughs) Well, I mean, I think that you've really touched on what it's looking like there, which is there there are so many people who have different ideas and competing ideas and some of their ways of expressing their culture they're pretty fierce about. So we already have Christians who are in England, but it's not completely Christianized yet, which means that there is a missionary effort sent from Rome, as you're saying. So what does it look like? for these missionaries? What is their task? How are they trying to accomplish Christianizing, well, first of all, the entire island, but especially (laughs) the region of England, which is what we're talking about today? Some have seen into this an attempt to really restore a kind of Roman orthodoxy, really, to the way in which Christianity is being practiced in Britain. And as, as you say, there are lots of people who are Christians, there are lots of people who are not Christians, and people with attachments to probably existing British cult and, and and deities, particularly in the west of the island at that time, and then people who are Old English-speaking peoples or speaking what later become Old English dialects. They're the people we, we think of as, as as having those deities, Woden and Thunor with their, with their Norse cognates, who seem to be the pagans that Augustine, later Augustine of Canterbury, is worried about going to convert. He writes back to the Pope saying, are you sure? Do I have to? They, they seem <laughs> like a, a, a pretty, uh, and it's a very loaded word, but they seem like a quite quite a savage people in, mm-hmm. in their beliefs. Of course, at the same time, the first king he goes to meet, Athelbert of Kent, his wife Bertha, is a Christian already. And that's part of the groundwork that's uh, that's already there. So are they bringing books? How are they teaching when they're starting to Christianize the people there? All sorts of possible ways, I suppose. (laughs) And one of the benefits that Christianization brings is, of course, writing and the possibilities that writing law codes and charters affords to, to those who are in power. But in terms of teaching, something that leapt immediately to mind is the missionary Paulinus, who's sent north into Northumbria to the court of King Edwin, and to a site that I've written about a few times. Bede calls it Adgefrin Yevring, which is in Northumbria, and Paulinus conducts a mass public baptism there in the nearby River Glen, and he spends quite a long period of time there making sure that all of the people in the region who come to this centre are baptised. So in terms of education, big public events at sites which are of monumental importance is a good way of ensuring teaching. In the decades, centuries following the establishment, the erection of stone crosses becomes one of the ways of, of cementing this in the landscape. But really, and this is what John Blair wrote about most persuasively in his book, The Church in Anglo-Saxon Society in 2005, is, is through the extension of minsters, royal minsters, which are led very often by royal women like Abbess Hild or, or like St. Athelthrith, which are a way of connecting religion and people and place and power. Right. And this is the perfect segue because I'm going to ask you about Yevring. <laughs> there is a place that Paulinus chose to conduct baptism in because it is a place of power and formerly of religion, we think. Can you tell us a little bit about the site at Yevring and how this has anything to do with trees? Let's get into trees now. <laughs> 
Okay. <laughs> so Yefrin is an early medieval site and it has been under reconsideration. I'm sure there are lots of things I don't know since the most recent excavations in the last few years, which which will make my knowledge and information out of date. But it, it sits on, on what's often described as a sort of whaleback plateau at the foot of a hill where there's a Bronze Age encampment. And Yefrin seems to be a, a site of British and then early Anglian rule, where a series of, of hall buildings are constructed over generations. It, it has parallel as one of these high status sites with other places also more recently excavated like Limming in Kent. It's arranged when these hall buildings are, are set up on an east-west axis, which doesn't necessarily mean in anything in and of itself, but it means that you'd, at the spring equinox, get a, a lovely sunrise cutting straight across the landscape. And the landscape of Britain, as elsewhere, is full of these sorts of solar monuments in one way or another. And what I found interesting at, at Yefrin is a series of buildings and structures there are picked out by these substantial timber posts. So one of them is to the northwest of a so-called temple building, which is difficult because it's a difficult identification because we don't really have what you'd call temple buildings necessarily elsewhere in early medieval England. You get things which which look like shrines, which seem to be a development from Romano-British structures. And the reason this one of the reasons this has been referred to as a temple building is because of the huge number of cattle skulls that were found within it. So there's a huge great wooden post square towards its northwest corner. And then there's another big wooden post near an amphitheater and then another inside hall and then at its furthest eastern extent and then inside a kind of stockade, a big cattle enclosure. And these wooden posts really pick out the site. One of them stands at each of these seemingly key locations. So Yefrin is often or has been interpreted as a place where an itinerant king, a traveling king like Edwin, might come periodically in order to feast and to collect rents and tribute in the form of cattle on the hoof, potentially slaughtered for feasting. Meetings may take place at this amphitheatre and Presumably, this is all being conducted to some extent under a kind of divine authority. What exactly that is, we don't and can't know. But in later texts, particularly in things like the riddles and the dream of the rude, there is this emphasis, this focus, this interest on what happens to a tree when you take it out of the forest and transform it into something else, like a wooden pillar. And these objects a plough in next to book riddle 21 or the cross of the crucifixion in the dream of the rude they know and remember that they are trees it's not the same as the kind of experience many modern westerners often experience which is timber as material which is hidden away behind paint or plaster timber is out there it's something tangible you remember that the structure around you is something that used to be a tree. I'm saying this to you now, touching the structures of my roof, which I happen to know are Baltic, a Baltic pine because of the way they've been cut. I'm in a reassemblage of trees right here and right now. The other thing to say is that some of the terminology that's used to describe timbers that have been cut down in this way, particularly in texts like The Dream of the Rude, helps to remember that a timber object is a tree and a tree is a timber object as well so that's part of my part of my interest really it's why are these things in these places what does it tell us about the potential significance attached to the tree uprooted severed from its stem and replaced in these places of human activity well they're connected with stories of power, with sustenance and with kingship. There is something about the life of a tree, which in so many contexts globally suggests all of these properties. Are they being harnessed in that way? We can't know for certain. I think they are. It's a good guess. I mean, because as you say, in other cultures across the world, trees have a very important place. They're a resource and they're shown a lot of respect. So being from Canada, one of the things that I was thinking of when you mentioned in the book, this huge pole or a bunch of huge poles at the site of Yevering is the totem poles of North America, because 
you could have quite a lot of significance attached to something like this. And it's so tantalizing to want to find out what this is, but you're not quite sure from just the stump that's left in the ground what could have possibly been there. So there are some theories that are floated in your book about what these might possibly have looked like. Do you have a good guess about what one of the ways or many of the ways that this might have appeared to people back in the day? I guess this is moving into the realms of pure speculation. (laughs) Yes, that's fair. Pure speculation. (laughs) At this point, which is fun to do. I can say a little bit more about that pillar because I've been doing a bit more thinking about it recently. The big one that's next to the temple building, given that split oak timbers constitute so much of the building of buildings of early medieval England, and that an oak would have been specifically well suited to making this kind of object. If you have a, a, a Kirkus robo or an, an oak of its type growing in the landscape, you could reach maturity at around around 70 years old in order to make something that's girth matches the faces of, of this pillar. So a really substantial object, and we can only guess at how tall it is. But I would imagine that in order to be large enough to be seen and visible, against the height of the temple building, which is quite substantial itself. This is going to be really quite huge. So is it standing with blank faces unadorned as a sort of Stanley Kubrick style monolith just <laughs> radiating this arboreal power? I mean, that would be impressive enough. The tradition of carving foliot forms and vine scroll that's introduced and used to carve stone crosses and stone monuments is Mediterranean. So we can't say that there's anything, as far as I understand from the stone sculpture experts, we can't say there's anything like a a continuity of existing insular tradition that's then mapped onto stone sculpture. So what did it look like? I I don't know beyond that. There's mention of posts being adorned with, you know, images of things like the stag and the serpent. And it would certainly make sense from all of the other designs that we have on things like metalwork to suppose that there were things perhaps like uh, zoomorphic forms. So things in the shapes of animals, those swirling patterns. Yeah. But I don't know. We also know that, for example, after St. Oswald is killed by Pender of Mercia, that his body parts are stuck on pillars and posts. So these could have been really quite brutal, grisly things decorated with the severed body parts and innards of your conquered enemies as well. (laughs) So I certainly wouldn't want to conjure a picture that these are symbols of a kind of, you know, tree-ish arboreal beauty that we'd be able to see today and go, ah, this is inspiring. They they are likely to have been, I suppose, like the tree in in the poem, The Dream of the Rood, things that were awesome, you know, that inspired a sense of awe and that there was perhaps fear and horror and possibly beauty were mingled up in those things together. Yes, I think that is probably correct. And it's so frustrating that we'll never know, but maybe someday there will be a time machine. We can go check these out for ourselves. I'm, hold, I'm holding out for one of them being discovered in, in a bog or something like that. Yeah. Uh, which I can say a little touch more about. Excavations at Great Ryber, I'm probably saying that wrong, in, in Norfolk, I think in 2016-17 by the Museum of London Archaeology. And there were 81, I think that's the right figure, <laughs> dug out log coffins that were found there. Very un- unusual. I, I don't think they appear in, in this form anywhere, well, in many places in early medieval England at all. But for some reason, this community, 7th to 9th century, so in the conversion era and thoroughly Christianized, decided that they would all be buried in dug out logs. So we do have good sized surviving timbers from from the period and perhaps one day we'll find a 7th century timber and we'll know a bit more about what they might have looked like. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it will still have paint on it, I'm sure. (laughs) (laughs) And then trail. (laughs) Right. Well, this brings me to another part of the book, which is trees within their own situations and within forests or within glades or things like that, where Some people in written sources, especially people who are trying to make pagans look bad, mention that this could be a place full of entrails. So can you tell us a little bit about, I don't know if worship is the right word, but the 
the way people regarded trees within their own landscape. I can give you some thoughts on the <laughs> yeah on what, what the pre-Christian context might have might have looked like, but what I think is interesting as well is the way in which this is absorbed into the fabric of culture more generally. And the whole point of the book really is to look at this element of environment as part of religious continuity. You know, an older school of scholarship would go hunting for pagan survivals and that definitely wasn't something i was i was trying to do but rather to talk about the things that these traditions shared and that were part of what became part of mainstream religious thought so what we do have in terms of understandings of the sacred character of woodland really amounts to place names and place names that attach particular areas of woodland to deities in one way or another. So there are not many of them, but some which use a word like we, and the phrase uh, survives in Wheelie Castle today in the West Midlands, for example, and that's idle wood or the wood of the idols. Clearly an appellation that it's given by someone subsequently to say, you know, this is a place where people used to do weird things in the forest. Mm -hmm. Also associations with Woden and Thunor as well, and another deity too. What are they doing there? Hard to say, really. We don't we don't have the evidence, but these places are sometimes attached to Lee place names, so L E A H. A lot of discussion about what that means, particularly. Della Hook has had, I I think, the most recent last word, indicating that it's woodland of a kind of open character. So woodland which isn't particularly dense and would lend itself well to some kind of religious celebration in the air really so there is this character going on that evidence this character of early religion which is not indoors which is which is outdoors which is situated in these spaces as is also seems to be the case with other features of the landscape like hilltops and bodies of water as well I wrote an article about the beginning of a poem called Judgment Day 2. It's an adaptation of a Latin poem that was originally attributed to Bede, and I'm fairly sure I wrote about this in the Trees book. Well, it's in an article. At the beginning of the Latin poem takes us into a hortus conclusus, so an enclosed garden which belongs to this biblical and classical tradition of going to a place of running waters and uh, you know quiet streams and flowers and trees and fragrant grasses in order to undergo some form of contemplation the latin poem gives us quite a short sort of snippet there but the the old english translation really goes to to town and it expands this description it gives us something that seems to be akin to a clearing it's surrounded by a kind of hedge and it seems to be a place that is easy to conjure in the mind for the poet, for the old English poet. So woodlands then are a space for encountering the divine and thinking about and engaging with the divine across the period one way or another. It doesn't, doesn't matter if you're a devotee of Thono or the Christian God. These are places you can go in order to have that kind of experience, you know, as people do to this day in all sorts of contexts. Yes, and it seems evident from your work that when the Christian missionaries came, they were really invested in making sure that they took these symbols and worked with them. So can you tell us a little bit about the ways that they took these symbols of trees and Christianized them in a way that would be harmonious and make the transition a little easier? Yeah, so there again used to be this approach which was thinking about the rooting out or stifling of this existing insular culture and religious culture and set of beliefs and understandings about trees and other elements of the environment. The documentary evidence that we have from the get-go is pretty straightforward about the fact that this is not how they were engaging with existing ways of thinking. Gregory advises in his conversion, don't do it by leaps, do it by steps. You're far more likely to get a population on side with your ideas if you are there with them in the landscape, engaging with what they already do over a sustained period of time. The Venerable Bede is particularly critical of those who don't go 
to the effort of maintaining communities and regular ministry you know in the far flung wild places there is something particularly important to him as there is with the early christian church generally about going to far flung places and investing in them and maintaining christian community there bead as i mentioned in the book says sussex doesn't have, doesn't have its ecclesiastical infrastructure sorted out at his time and he's writing in the 730s so the approach to engaging with existing thought and realigning it with Jewish and Christian thought is what's more important. And I don't know of many richer stores than than the Bible for imagery that rests solidly on the shoulders, mixing metaphors, of <laughs> trees and vegetation. The Old Testament is extraordinarily rich in, in material, New Testament so much shorter, but the parables are agricultural fundamentally, and the sorts of people who the texts of the Bible are intending to speak to are the same people who are engaged with working the land that the missionaries are trying to communicate with as well. So this, as I argue in the case of the Dream of the Rood, is about a realignment, a gentle correction of existing approaches, saying the tree that you have been venerating that has called out to you throughout this time of spiritual darkness let me show you what this really is. This is the cross, which seems to have been a far more successful way of doing things than brutally persecuting pagan belief. I mean, there are all sorts of other reasons why it was politically and socially attractive as well for, for people of all different social strata too, but I, I think this was one of them. I think you're right. And for the people who haven't come across Dream of the Rood, you've given a short overview of it. Can you tell us what happens in this poem? What is this poem actually about? I'll give you the opening. What each swefna kist sechan wille, what may ye met a tomidra nicht, sithen reod berenda resta wounedon. I want to tell you about the best of dreams, what I dreamed in the middle of the night when bearers of speech, that is, other people, were at rest. The dreamer says, uh, he, goes, he goes on to say, I thought I saw this rarer tree lifted into the air and enveloped in light. And he sees this beautiful tree appear and then it starts to change between ornate coverings of gold and, and sort of rich fabrics. And at one and the same time, he's also seeing that it's covered with blood and gore. And the tree begins to speak to the dreamer and to the audience of the poem. And it says, it was long ago, but I still remember it, that I was cut down at the edge of the forest and moved from my stem, turned into this weapon of execution. It goes on to talk about this conflict between its own internal desire to break apart and to fell its enemies, to cut them down, and its desire to serve, to serve Christ, who appears not as the sort of meek and suffering man of sorrows of the later med medieval tradition, but appears in various other guys, of course, but as a conquering warlord, the tree of the dream is is like his his steed. It's like his war horse. So the tree functions in this way. Both of them are wounded together, is cut down, later rediscovered. And the dreamer tells us towards the end of the poem that he now uses it as a symbol within his breast or on his breast as a sign of his hope for the journey forth, what lies ahead. So it's a poem which is about discovery and revelation. And one of the reasons that it's particularly important in the context of the book is because it also appears or a form of an earlier precursor appears carved in runes on the Ruthel Cross, which is a probably 8th century carved Northumbrian monument, which also has this vine scroll that I mentioned earlier. I think it's a particularly elegant way of showing the way you can bring the two cultures together so that it's not necessarily about conflict. You do have some examples in the book about continental trees, massive trees being taken down because people will not stop leaving offerings there, for example. But the dream of the root is a really good example, I think, of bringing these things together because it's not always a head-to-head -head conflict between two different religions. It's a way of bringing these things together in order for the missionary goal, which is to Christianize everyone on the island. But I think it's a really good example of that. Thank you. I hope so. <laughs>
Well, before I let you go, I do want to mention one of the secular aspects that's in the book about the symbolism of trees, and that's using them as meeting places for political things, for get-togethers, for meetings, for judicial reasons. So can you just tell us briefly a little bit about how people use trees as meeting places and where we can find that evidence today? So one of the best places that we can find it is in the names of so-called hundred meeting places. And a hundred is a, a kind of administrative unit. So on, on a monthly basis, whoever is in charge of that particular hundred might have a, a hundred court. And these aren't always trees, sometimes they're mounds and sometimes stones. But we do have some trees which have Old English personal names attached to them. So not that the tree was named that, so far as we know, that <laughs> whoever was in, in power over that hundred at, at a particular time had a tree. And people would gather together at this tree and the business of the day would take place there. So if there are fines to pay or people who need to be brought to justice, that's where you do it. So they're firmly ingrained in difficult to disentangle the sacred and the secular, but things that are very much mundane at the same time. And the reason for that, well, easy to gather at a big tree that's well known in the landscape, although we know that they are also using tree stumps in, in things like boundary clauses that mark the edges of land estates much later on. But then we also know from, from other sources that trees are meeting places for doing things like mustering armies. So I mention in the book two examples of this. One, one is Eiley Oak, for example, where Alfred the Great has a sort of follow-up after an initial meeting at a well-known stone. Everyone gathers gathers up after that first moot at a tree which is on the boundary of these land units in order to prepare to do battle with Viking armies. And we also know from one of the so-called Anglo-Saxon chronicles that the army of Harold Godwinson and the English meet on Senlac Hill around a Haran apple, a, a hoary or grey or probably lichen encrusted apple tree, which is again well known enough as a as a local landmark that the last fighting force of, of Wessex and its allies are, are able to meet there and make their stand. I love that, having trees that are so big and so well known. You could just ask anybody nearby and they'd say, here's where you go. Everyone knows what this tree is called. And one of the ways that you bring it together again with Christianity is you've you've found some notations in writing that say, find the tree with the Christ mark, find the tree that has a Christian symbol on it, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think one of the things that all of this evidence reveals is the significance of local knowledge of trees in the area and that that simply is was is and was part and parcel of how people knew and understood their landscape it's something living in modern canterbury that i do with trees that i know i use for different things throughout the year so i know where there's a meddler tree look that one up if you don't know what a meddler is i'm sure you do i know where the where the elders elder trees are for collecting elderberries i know where the good trees for for apples and scrumping are and that kind of thing you your environmental map as i'm sure it will be too many listening to this is well developed in that way. And that's part of the insight I think we get from the text. I think that is lovely and so, so human, right? When you come to that personal experience of your own landscape and what it means to you and having trees at the center of that, I think is, is common to many of us on this planet, if not most of us. So thank you so much, Michael, for coming and putting that into context in a medieval context. Thanks so much for coming on to talk about trees. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a real pleasure. To find out more about Michael's work, you can visit his faculty webpage at the University of Southampton. The book we focused on today is Trees in the Religions of Early Medieval England. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's up, Peter? Hey, hey. Well, this week I came across a really interesting social media post that said there was this law in 14th century Barcelona that said if you're a banker, you could get executed for going bankrupt. And even more interesting, there was actually a banker that got beheaded in 1360 for this. So I was really curious to see if this was actually true. It, I went down a rabbit hole looking for answers. 
And it, you know, the fun thing, it, yeah, it was. It was true. Francesca Costello was beheaded in front of his house in 1360 for being a bankrupt banker. Wow. Yikes. I started doing the research slowly. As I did it, like, I got very interested to see how this went from a little bag of academic trivia in a book from the 1940s and how it went all the way to becoming a social media viral post on Twitter and Reddit. So I wrote about that, this kind of journey of a bit of inf medieval information. Awesome. So the article is about the journey or the beheading or both? It's about both. I, I will give you a few more details about uh, this poor, poor banker and maybe why he got beheaded. And then all these steps for the last 80 years. Wow. Amazing. What a journey. What a journey yeah. for that head to take. <laughs> so we've got that. We've got Lucy Lemonnier has a, a piece on four medieval source books. Nice. And there's also a piece about a 14th century abbot who went on a killing and arson spree in Southeast England in the 14th century. He paid a fine. Well, if he's an abbot, then yep. Yep. Yeah. Well, that is a whole bunch of interesting information. Thank you so much, Peter, for bringing this to our attention, because all of those stories are worth checking out. I, I hope you do. I hope everyone does. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. A big shout out to everyone who supports my podcast, as well as other indie podcasts and historians through Medievalist.net's Patreon page. Patrons can access all sorts of awesome stuff like subscriptions to the Medieval Magazine and Medieval World Magazine, as well as ad-free versions of Medievalist.net and this podcast. To get in on all the action, please visit patreon.com slash medievalists. For everything from trees to bees, follow Medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at Medievalists. You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores where you can pre-order my new book, Chivalry and Courtesy, Medieval Manners for a Modern World, which is slightly delayed but still coming soon on October 17th. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Gee Frog. Thanks for listening and have yourself an amazing day. Music